Howdy! This week in our online Bio One Lab, we are going to look at cellular respiration. Cellular respiration, if we zoom out to a whole ecological perspective, is part of the global carbon cycle uh, and a, a major reason why energy leaves the Earth as heat. So light comes in to the ecosystem, so energy comes in as light, it leaves as heat. Meanwhile, molecules such as carbon are cycled through the system rather than flowing through the system. So carbon is going to be uh, glued together, so it's going to be reduced. Carbon dioxide is reduced to organic molecules such as glucose during photosynthesis. That's an endergonic reaction requiring light energy. That uh, glucose can then be oxidized, broken down in the uh, process of cellular respiration, producing ATP, releasing heat, and producing carbon dioxide as a waste product. The food we eat is digested, broken down into smaller macromolecules, put into our bloodstream, where a lot of it goes into our cells and, and is used as the fuel to generate ATP, the ATP being the molecule that powers most of our cellular processes. This reaction is uh, shown here where glucose is going to be oxidized, so glucose and oxygen react, forming carbon dioxide. So glucose is, is going to be oxidized to carbon dioxide. We're going to produce water here. Uh, oxygen is the last electron acceptor in the electron transport chain, receiving those electrons and being reduced to water. And of course, ATP is generated during this process. This process is kind of the reverse of, of, of photosynthesis. So if you draw an arrow going the other way and, and add in sunlight, you can basically uh, see here that uh, photosynthesis is the reverse reaction of cellular respiration. The organism that we would use this week is yeast. Yeast is a single-celled eukaryote. So its cells have basically the same organelles that yours have, including mitochondria. And so yeast can break down sugars, uh, metabolize them, and spit out CO2 pretty well. In fact, they do it so well, we use them to make bread. So yeast uh, release carbon dioxide gas. When, when we put them into dough, they release that gas, forming air bubbles, causing bread to rise. Now, we would have a lot of different solutions out this week for you to use in your experiment, including sucrose, uh, a disaccharide. So we're going to use sucrose instead of just straight glucose. We would have mannitol, which is a sugar alcohol that is not easily metabolized. We would have um, um, several things out that I'm going to introduce you to in the next slide. So I'm just going to skip past the slide since we're not actually doing the experiment uh, this week um, and show you what the basic stock solutions are. We would have 400 millimolar sucrose, once again a disaccharide, 400 millimolar mannitol, a sugar alcohol that is not easily metabolized. We'll talk about why we have that in a moment. And we would have citrate. Uh, citrate is where the citric acid cycle gets its name. Now, most tables would do two replications in this lab, so that's what I'll show you here, an example data table. I want you to predict what would happen in this case. So I want you to draw a graph, um, not, not uh, a graph with numbers on it, but a graph showing relative, uh, relative production of CO2 by yeast in each of these conditions. So which one would have a tall column, which one would have a shorter column, uh, so on and so forth. This would indeed be a column graph this week, not a scatter plot. So you will be making a column graph to show this data. You can tell it will be a column graph because you can see here that the uh, independent variable is is uh, in this case a category. It's it's a type of sugar or a type of food. It's not a number. So when you have uh, discrete data on one axis, discrete data meaning like categories instead of numbers, then you know you need a column graph. So here we have um, these different treatments. What you would do, uh, if you look on page 48 of your manual, you would make a yeast stock solution and bring it back to your bench. You'd have this yeast sitting at your bench. And then um, you would mix in a beaker 1.5 mils of sucrose to 1.5 mils of mannitol. Now mannitol is a uh, ethanol, uh, mannitol is a alcohol sugar, so it's, it's a sugar, but it's not edible by yeast. 
The reason you see mannitol in several of these concentrations that we're making is that it helps us to maintain the same osmotic balance in each of these treatments regardless of what else is in that test tube or in that beaker. So what I mean by that is we, we wouldn't want to accidentally create a hypotonic in one uh, solution in one treatment and a hypertonic solution in another treatment because that would be an additional variable that would affect the rate of respiration. So we make sure that the yeast are exposed to the same concentrations of solute in every one of these treatments regardless of what else is in that test tube and that's what the the mannitol helps us to do except for the last one water which is just a pure straight hypotonic solution right uh, to that yeast uh, that yeast is in a hypotonic solution when it's in water so the first solution is half sucrose half mannitol every one of these um, solutions is three milliliters so there would have been three mils in each of these um, each of these these beakers or test tubes and you would add yeast to that so 1.5 mils of sucrose sucrose is food mannitol can't be eaten so what do you think would happen well that one basically is your positive control meaning it's it's something you know is food uh, sucrose can be eaten by yeast so you I would expect a lot of respiration there personally then we would give them straight up three mils of just mannitol to make sure that uh, they're not really eating that. We, we have to check to see though, right? We would also give them 1.5 mils of citrate and 1.5 mils of mannitol. You'll want to think about what that might do. You would also give them 1.5 mils of sucrose and 1.5 mils of citrate to see what that might do. And lastly, lastly, our negative control, which is no food at all, nothing at all, just straight water, three mils of straight water. What do you think that would do? So when I say, what will that do? How much carbon dioxide would be made by these yeast? Typically, we read this in uh, this rate of respiration in parts per million CO2 per minute. Uh, occasionally, it might read out in CO2 per second, but I think all the data we have this semester is in per minute form. If you recall from studying cellular respiration in lecture, acetyl-coenzyme A is produced when pyruvate is oxidized. And that acetyl-CoA comes into the citric acid cycle where it reacts with oxal acetate to produce citrate, one of the first intermediates in this several step metabolic pathway. Citrate inhibits phosphofructokinase, which is not only fun to say, but it is an important enzyme in the process of glycolysis. It's one of the first enzymes in that metabolic pathway. So here's the, here's the citric acid cycle. It produces citrate. When there's an abundance of citrate produced, it can inhibit phosphofructokinase. So we predict that maybe that will have an effect on the rate of respiration. So look back at those different solutions that I listed earlier and make a prediction what will happen? How will phosphofructokinase uh, affect respiration? How will it be different from just straight water? How will that be different from sucrose? How will that be different from straight mannitol? And, and come up with a hypothesis there. Your hypothesis can be a little bit of a free form hypothesis this week because there's several um, items interacting here. There's several columns here. So I know that's a bit uh, complicated but what I would like to see um, what I would like to see in a hypothesis is your prediction as to which of the treatments would have the most respiration which one would be second which one would be third which one would be fourth and which one would have the least amount of respiration that's what I'm going to look for you can ask your instructor your specific uh, lecture instructor if they have more specific instructions in terms of what to look for in that hypothesis now um, when it comes to your figure, you're going to do a lab summary for this lab, and there may be some questions on that summary, so don't skip those. But a, a summary uh, is going to be a hypothesis, a figure, a conclusion, and perhaps a few questions. It will be on the lab website along with this video. Your figure is going to be a column graph with lots of columns, okay? So you're going to have a column for citrate, a column for mannitol, a column for uh, uh, table sugar, so sucrose, a uh, column for water, and you'll have error bars on there. Uh, you're going to have a caption, and my suggestion is, and once again, pay attention to what your instructor says, but 
I suggest we don't worry about quantifying change on this graph because there's so many columns. I don't need to see how many percent different each column is from each other. That would be a, a bit much. But you do want to have statements on repl number of uh, uh, replications, uh, mean and SE, and all of that. And there is a video on how to make um, a column graph on the uh, lab website. Okay. So if you have any questions on this, make sure to contact your lab instructor. They're here to help you. Um, and until then, have a great week. Good luck with, uh, f with graphing this data and interpreting this data. And uh, I'll see you uh, on, in the photosynthesis lab next week.